Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C., and Harvard Bookstore in Boston, Mass., it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Elizabeth Strout to discuss her new novel, O William, published by our friends at Random House. Happy book birthday to O. William, which will officially be out in the world tomorrow. Elizabeth Strout is the number one New York Times bestselling author of so many beloved books, including Olive Again, Anything is Possible, winner of the Story Prize, My Name is Lucy Barton, The Burgess Boys, Olive Kitteridge, for which she received the Pulitzer Prize, Abide With Me, and Amy and Isabel, winner of the Los Angeles Times Art Seidenbaum Award and the Chicago Tribune Heartland Prize. Elizabeth has also been a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award and the Orange Prize in London. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Cynthia Dupree Sweeney, the author of the instant New York Times bestselling novels, The Nest and Good Company. She has been a guest on today Late Night with Seth Meyers and NPR's All Things Considered. The Nest has been optioned by AMC Studios and is in development as a limited series. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and we'll have time to answer a few of these after their conversation. All ticket holders, your books will ship out to you tomorrow. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest to the virtual stage. Hello. And Hi, welcome. thank you so much for having me here. And uh, hello, everybody. Thank hello. you so much for being here. Hello. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm trying to toggle Cynthia on. And for some reason, she's not popping on. Okay. <laughs> Oh my. Okay. <laughs> Cynthia, do you have an ability to like just hover over your image and see if you can toggle yourself yeah. on? Yep. If not, we're going to have to reprompt you in. It's not. Um, I see the little red. Uh -huh. It's stuck. Okay. So Cynthia, do you mind just like, can we pop, can we toggle you back on? Like, can, can we start from the very beginning? I'm going to, I'm going to X you out and bring you back on. Okay, let's do that. All righty. So here we go. Invite her back on. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Come on in. I see you're still coming into the room with us. Here we go. Here we are. And there she is. Hello. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience. And I am so thrilled uh, to be here with Elizabeth Strout, whose work I have admired uh, literally since her first book. I am I am a true fan. And um, and maybe um, because she's a writer, maybe because she published a little later in life, like me, and I think like Elizabeth, Lucy Barton is especially close to my heart. And I was so happy to open O. William and be back in her consciousness and in her world and um, in this really beautiful and wise and funny book. And uh, you're all in for a treat. But I thought maybe, um, maybe Elizabeth, you could just briefly bring us up to date where Lucy is when we meet her again. Well, Lucy is um, at that, at the point in O. William, she's, um, I think she's 63, and her second husband has just passed away in the last number of months. And, um, well, no, he was actually alive at the beginning of the book. Sorry, she's looking back. Anyway, <laughs> so her husband at this point is this, her second husband, to whom she was very, very happily married, has recently passed away. And she and William, who had been married for almost 20 years, um, have been friendly in a certain kind of way for many, many years since, and then certain things befall him, and he ends up asking Lucy for help. 
Yeah. I find the relationship quite moving. Um, yeah, I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm glad. I, really, I, I, I really loved it. I'm 61. And so I'm at a point in my life where um, a lot of, I've, see, I've seen a lot of friends get divorced. And right. it's interesting how some of those divorces are gentle and loving and, and some are not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting because yeah. everything is always different and, you know, unique to the people that are involved. But right. um, I think I saw Lucy and William as being capable of having, you know, the sort of tenderness and yet irritation with each other that we see in the book. Right. Well, Lucy is such a loving person and... She's so hard on herself, um, yeah, poor Lucy. Not, but not, but not nearly as hard on other people. And yeah, it's it, interesting. It that is allows interesting. that, you know, that that's what allows her to let William back in her life in that way. Right. Um, right. right. I wanted to ask you about the very last line of the acknowledgments, which says to Laura Linney, who unwittingly right. and miraculously gave bloom to this entire book. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, you know, Laura Linney played in a one-woman um, show on Broadway and earlier in London. Um, and I was at a rehearsal with her, and she was reading the script, and she took a step forward, and she murmured something about William. And then she put her glasses up on top of her head and took one more step. And at that point, I just realized, Oh, William. And it just like arrived. I thought, Oh, William, of course, William. And that's when, and that title stuck throughout the entire of the book because, because it's appropriate because there's so many different ways that Lucy can say, Oh, William, <laughs> you know, but really and truly it was at that moment. I have no idea what she murmured, but something. And I just thought, Oh, William, because in my name is Lucy Barton. Lucy has deliberately sidestepped her marriage. She tells right. the reader, I'm not going to talk about that marriage. Right. And then whatever happens in that rehearsal room, I just realized, oh, William. So, I, I mean, we knew a few things about William. We knew that he was the, the son of a prisoner of war from Germany right. and that his mother had been the farmer's wife of the place where he had been sent to work in Maine yeah. on the potato farm. But that's really about all we knew. And then, so from there, I realized, oh, this can be so much fun. I do want to ask you what it was like to have your book adapted for the stage, because, um, you know, um, I know many writers who really yearn for television or film adaptation, and 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 I don't. I for me, yeah. the book thing I care about putting out in the world, um, exactly. I wouldn't say no to it, but it's not. It right. seems like, like an extra thing. But a stage play, that I'm really envious of because I love the theater and I love what happens in the theater. I love um, that interaction between actors. Right. And, so what was and that? Like? Yeah. yeah. I've always loved theater. I've just always, always loved it. And I mean, from way, way back. And in some ways, writing is almost like being an actor. It's not, but it is in the sense that I'm always trying to put myself into a different person. So I've always been really, really interested in it. And then, um, and I just think Laura Linney is sublime. And oh, it was so just, great. it was like, oh, I can't believe it. So that was, it was just great. She's wonderful. Um, I'm wondering how a book starts for you. You just told us about how, how O. William begins. But generally, is it is it is it a person? Is it a is it a place? Is it different all the time? It's always a person. For me, it's always a person because you know, um, because I just think people are so endlessly interesting, and I always have. I mean, my whole entire life, I've just never, even now, I can't think of anything as interesting as people, <laughs> because they're just such swirling pools of different things every single person so so for me it always starts with the character and yeah. and and i understood that years ago just because i'm so deeply interested in what it feels like to be a different person and from a very young age you know i have watched and listened my entire life you know if i'm sitting on the subway um the woman across from me i'll think 
Oh, right. Now the pants probably feel like that because they look a little tight. So I understand that. Feel. You know, it's just so intuitive for me at this point. Yeah. So, um, so it will always start with a person. Um, I think I'm, I think I'm right that um, Lucy Barton and, um, and, and this latest book are the only two books you've written in the first person. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's I'm true. curious about that. I mean, when I start reading a book in the first person as a reader, I get this little frisson of excitement because you have access yeah. to that person in such an intimate way, in a way that you don't right. in the third person. But I'm it's curious a, as a writer how, yeah. it, how it feels because there must also be limitations to it. Well, exactly. It's an entirely different way of expressing oneself to the reader. Um, because when you're in first person, you can only see through that okay. person. You can't be the omniscient, you know, narrator who's going from point of view to point of view. You can only see, but that makes you have to play off the other characters, you know, a little in a different way, which is fun. But, but it was, um, it was different for me to write Lucy Barton. And I think that, you know, in the Burgess Boys, there's a prologue. Nobody mm -hmm. remembers it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. But it's just a little two or three page prologue of a first person narrator who's also a writer, but by no means Lucy Barton, but a writer who's talking to her mother about writing the book of the Burgess Boys. And I just wrote it. Um, I wrote that prologue just sort of, you know, for in, I don't know why I wrote it, but my editor, Susan Campbell, she loved that prologue. So I said, okay, I can say it. But I honestly think looking back that there was something about that that opened the door mm -hmm. for me yeah. to be yeah. able to then go into another first person. Yeah, because it is a big leap from- Yeah, it's a huge leap. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. In the books, in both books that Lucy narrates, she pulls herself back or maybe you pull her back or maybe yeah. she pulls you back. Um, right. but I'm wondering, if you're aware while you're writing of how much information the reader needs? Well, you know, Lucy is a strange one because she just came, I mean, in my mind, um, Lucy is just so informed by her background mm -hmm. of, of real deprivation on every level. I mean, mm -hmm. like I, I was thinking, especially as, as I was writing on William, I realized, okay, so nobody mirrored Lucy back to herself as a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think of babies and people saying, oh, look at you, you know, the mother there. So right. nobody really did that for Lucy. And so her sense of the world would have to be almost like, like she says, a cultural blind spot. I mean, it was best time about cultural, but I mean, in many ways, she does feel invisible right. because she doesn't have, she, de she never developed that sense of self. And that's why when um, William says you're a spirit, I thought, oh yeah, she is. Yeah, she yeah. is. But, um, I don't, I don't want to give anything away in this book, but there are some really lovely moments where you are able to see Lucy through William's eyes, and it gives you right. a perspective on her, and it's right. they're really beautiful. Right. Right, like when he says, I don't think this is getting anything away, but when he says, you know, Lucy, I married you because you were filled with joy. And then when I saw what you came from, I thought, how could you be filled with joy? And then, and I realized, I thought, but she is filled with joy. She's one of those strange people who comes from a terrible background. And actually, she is open hearted and she is available to joy in spite right. of all her anxieties. And right. so for William to say that, then the reader think the reader can perceive that as they want to, you know. Right. Um, Lucy is occupied in both books with telling the truth. Um, she talks a lot about writing a truthful sentence. And, and I always think about that heartbreaking moment um, where her sister confronts her and anything is possible and is so angry at her um, because she's heard her talking about writing this truthful sentence. And, and her sister is so frustrated because she hasn't written the whole story. She hasn't written the facts, which of course is different from the right. truth. So right. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about what a truthful sentence means to you as a writer. Ooh. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big one. I mean, um, I have always tried to find a truthful sentence my entire writing life, which started about the age of four or five. But, you know, so I've been trying to figure out what that means 
for many, many years. And all I can say is that at this point in my writing life, I can only say that when I write it, I recognize it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't really help out more than that. I mean, no, it's just so happens. difficult to put well, words around what a truthful sentence is. Um, I think sometimes, sometimes as a writer, especially when it comes with difficult subjects, you dance around it for a while. You write around it yeah. until, until you get to that point where, um, yeah, it's just a feeling. It's a feeling of like, okay, this is this is okay. Right. Right. I remember years ago, I would say to myself, just say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it, but like the simplest advice and the hardest thing to do. Yeah, oh, Especially. absolutely. It's very difficult to do. Right, exactly. Um, a lot has been written about you as being a main writer, but I don't think of you as being a main writer. I think of you as being a, a writer who has this incredible capacity to see inside people who are, to use a main expression, from away. People who are outsiders, who are displaced, who don't feel like they belong. And right. I think a lot of your characters, well, I have two questions. The first one is a lot of your characters can sort of be sorted into the people who are able to get away and the people who stayed. And I'm wondering if you think it's harder to leave or to stay. Oh, I think it's harder to stay. <laughs> Except it doesn't, I mean, you know what? That's not fair because it depends. That would depend on who the person is. I mean, I, I really do think that, you know, we're born with a certain nature and who we are will determine a lot of what happens to us, even though other forces will as well. So if we are a person that stays, it's because we need to or, or want to or something. Um, and then if we're born with a different kind of nature, then we need to get away. And so we will. It's interesting though. Yeah. Um, and I also, I always feel like, um, you know, I grew up in a place, I grew up in, I lived a very suburban life. I grew up in a place in Rochester, New York, which is actually oh, yeah. Midwestern. And I moved right. to New York City in my twenties. And I think that it was such a gift to not have grown up in New York City, to come yeah. to and live there for so long right. and have to figure it out yeah. and all these things that people took for granted. Lucy has to do that, of course, on a much grander scale um, because of her deprivation. Right. But but it but it but it helps being a writer, um, not yes. fitting in. I think so. I think so. I mean, certainly when I first arrived to New York, everybody that I knew said, Oh, New York will kill you. <laughs> yeah. And it was like Oh no, it won't. <laughs> the moment I saw it, I was like, "Wow, look at all these people!" <laughs> I so for exactly somebody who's as interested in people as I am, it's like heaven. There is a moment in O William um, where Lucy describes—I think it's in O William—where she describes stepping out onto, you know, her apartment, walking out of the brownstone, and standing on the stoop, and just thinking, "I can't believe I, I know I live here," and I. I felt that way every day of my life in New York, and I lived there. That's for so interesting. You know, it's interesting because I was just thinking about. For some reason, she says that to Jeremy, right? And she, and she sees this look cross. I mean, he's a perfectly lovely man, but she sees this look cross his face, and that was her first intuition that a real person from New York or from a real urban person, right, has a deep distaste for the provincial. Yes, yeah, for that yeah. enthusiasm. Yeah. Even though people who grow up and live all their lives in Manhattan are some of the most provincial people on earth. I, I will, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the character in Olive Kitch was felt that way. The guy who drives up, yes. thinking that yeah. he, I believe he said that about New York. So anyway. <laughs> it, um, it is true. Yeah. Um, through your work, um, there's so much loneliness in this theme of loneliness, even, um, you know, even when you are connected to other people. Um, and I know from reading interviews of you that you share a belief that I do, which is that you can never truly know another human being, um, which frankly, I find a relief because <laughs> truly <laughs> another human being feels oh, very overwhelming. Right. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. I get it. 
Oh, that's so funny, right? <laughs> um, I did. I did find myself wondering when I was reading a William, if you believe that people can change. Yeah, I think people change. I think they're capable of changing. Yes, I do. I mean, they're not going to become somebody totally different. But they're, here's what I think, actually, now that you've asked. I think that I think that there reaches a point in people's lives where they can go either way. You know, I've, I've sort of noticed this. I've noticed this from a younger age, that there reaches a point in people's lives where they can either get bigger mm -hmm. and more embracing of the world, or they can get bitter and smaller. And and I don't think that you know ahead of time which tra trajectory mm -hmm. such a per any person will be on. Right. You know, I, I've found that myself. So, but I do think that I do think people are capable of getting bigger and more just more relaxed about being a person and just realizing, oh, we're all doing the best we can and, and right. therefore able to, you know, take it in with a little bit more. Yeah. That is interesting. It's almost, it's almost like what you're describing is what we used to call a midlife crisis because yeah. when you think of the early years of your life and meeting someone right. and getting married and starting a family, it's all about getting there, getting there, setting yeah, yeah, up, yeah, exactly. getting everything right. And right. then, and then you have to face the next thing, and exactly. it's like, right. It's like, is, am I, am I going to get bigger, right, or, or am I going to get smaller? And and right. that is that is, um, I think, often when relationships have to go their separate ways when right. those people right. don't know what's going to happen. Right. right. It's just it's an intangible thing I've noticed, but it's interesting for me. <laughs> because all people are interesting for me. So. Yeah, I know. Um, I wonder if you're going to miss being in New York and seeing all those people. Oh, I've already missed being in New York. We've already moved to Maine for good, but this is we've taken the studio, which has obviously nothing on the walls yet. But um, but we did. We've been in Maine for the pandemic. We moved yeah. there for good. And it was quite an adjustment for me, but I come from Maine, so it was like a little bit of like... Okay. <laughs> um, right back home. It's all right. I'm actually getting quite used to it. So, does it what? feel like home to you, Maine? Does it feel like home to you? You know, um, really, this sounds very corny, but um, honestly, at this point, home is where my husband is. Yeah, no, that doesn't sound corny at all. So, if he's there, that's home. I feel the same way. Yeah. Um, lucky us. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, your writing is so clean and precise, and it feels to me when I'm reading it totally effortless, which I know comes from a great deal of effort. Yeah. And I'm I'm curious when you sit down to write, how much of the story you know? Like, what kind of a do you think ahead? Do you? I don't know much of a story when I started. I really, I really don't, and um, and I don't worry about it too much because I feel like. Okay, if I'm not going to be surprised, then the reader won't be surprised. So I don't try and plan out much. And then, but then an idea will come to me and I'll think, oh, all right, let's earn our way there. Right. Right. And, um, but I, but I very frequently write in scenes, which I learned to do many years ago when I was raising my daughter and didn't have that much time to work. And I learned, okay, rather than try to get Isabel out of the AMP, you know, which would be like a whole day's work of just like getting her to get out of the AMP. I all of a sudden I just I just remember that day when I thought, just leave her in the AMP and just start a new scene. And it was so it was like, oh okay. And so that's when I learned it's like okay, if I can write scenes that I I, I think of if they have a heartbeat to them, then they stay. If they don't, they get tossed right. on the floor. Yeah. How much do you toss away a lot? I toss away a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Tons. <laughs> Um, yep. There's so much connectedness in your work, characters from other books, which yeah. I love. It's like a little tree. I, I can't help myself. <laughs> and it just makes me think. This, um, I guess, this is my question. Do your char your characters stay with you? Do they live with you? Is that like? Apparently, they do. <laughs> um, because you know, I certainly didn't set out to be a writer that was going to have a large circle of people that kept inter, you know, interconnecting with them, with each other. But but 
but I think I love them in a way that they do stay there with me. And, and so when I do see a way for them to connect, it's so exciting for me. And I think, you know, like with Olive again, I realized, oh, Jim and Helen Burgess would be driving their kid to summer camp in Maine. Oh, how fun. Okay. You know, so. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, it's it. very apparent that you love your characters. And it's why, um, even though some of them do, um, you know, make bad decisions, of course. Um, oh, they do awful um, things. Yeah, they do, awful, they do some really perverted things, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I never feel judgment from you, which is, right. you know, Right. To me, the most important thing a writer has to do is right. not look down on their characters. Yeah. Um, so that's not a question. It's <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it honestly is one of the joy. It's one of the more joyful parts of being a writer is that when I go to the page, I suspend judgment on my characters, and it's just so freeing because then you know I don't I don't have to care how badly behaved they are. I just have to record it as accurately as I can. Right. Right. Because they're just people. Yeah. Yeah. Doing their thing. Doing their thing. Making mistakes. <laughs> yep. Um, I yep. have a question. If anyone has questions, please um, dump them into the little question box. Um, Helen asks, this past year I reread all of your books in order. You have a rare ability, I think, to let the reader feel certain that we understand something to have happened without having been told directly. Um, this is astounding, and my name is Lucy Barton. Is this something that you think about and try to accomplish on person? Um, sorry, on purpose, or does it just happen because of how you tell your stories? Well, that's an interesting question. I think that it probably is just how I tell my story because I think, you know, I think about the reader all the time. Just so you all know, readers, I'm thinking about you guys. Um, every step of the way. And I think, okay, what does the reader need now? And, and I feel like, you know, we're together in this and I need to take charge of it, but I need to make the reader feel safe and all that sort of stuff. So I think that, um, I, I, I feel the point of what I'm trying to say is that I feel that every reader will come to what I present with their own stories. Mm -hmm. and, it will therefore become a different story for each reader. And it should, I mean, in my sense, in my mind, it should. And I was particularly aware when I was writing, my name is Lucy Barton, because her voice is very breathy. I think of her as having a breathy kind of voice. Mm -hmm. And and I realized, okay, this is good because the reader, I thought of it as a more porous kind of text. And I thought this is good because the reader will have more room to bring their own experiences to right. join into the book, so. Did you know when you started Lucy Barton that anything is possible was going to come? And did you, well, we know that you got the idea for O. William um, from the fabulous Laura Linney, but what about um, the relation between those two earlier books? You know, it was really, I was actually writing Anything Is Possible. I was begin, I was writing scenes from Anything Is Possible as, as I was writing My Name Is Lucy Barton. And that's because as I heard the mother and daughter talking in the hospital, I'm going to get curious. And I would think, right, those pretty nicely girls, what happened to them? And I would really ask you what I know. So I would yeah. like literally walk around and sit at the other end of the table and write a few scenes about what I thought maybe the nicely girls had turned into. And then I thought, well, what about Kathy nicely? What happened to her? So everybody that they mentioned, I was curious. And I, so at the end of My Name is Lucy Barton, I had all these scenes for anything as possible because I wanted to know what they were up to. <laughs> I love the pretty nice the girls. <laughs> um, does Lucy suffer from traumatic memory gaps? And is this something she will confront in O. William? Traumatic memory gap. That's interesting. Uh, yes. Is that what the word is? Yes, traumatic memory gaps. Um, I, you know, that's a very good question. I've never thought of it that way. Um, that's really interesting, probably. Um, mm -hmm. I think many people do, whether they're traumatic or not. <laughs> we all suffer from memory gaps of, right. of past experiences. Um, but she she probably could and, and not even realize that that's a really interesting thing. Yeah. 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 It does seem like um, you can definitely see her turning away from things. Right. And, but, but they come back. They often loop back, you know, yeah, like right. she has 
a moment where she can't quite look at look at something head on. Right. And, but then it comes back to her. Right. 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 But I, that's more the Lucy of O. William than the than the Lucy of My Name Is Lucy Barton. Right. I'm, I suspect that she does suffer from memory gaps. It's very interesting. I never, I never thought of that. And um, so, <laughs> whatever her memories are, we that's all we have of her. <laughs> uh, I would love to get to know Charlie McCauley. Is there an Oh Charlie book in your future? Oh, thank you so much for asking that question because Charlie McCauley. I have to tell you, that man, and I have no idea where he came from. He just showed up, as they do. But, boy, he breaks my heart. Yeah. He just breaks my heart. And I'm so glad that, you know, he and Patty nicely have a chance mm -hmm. for some happiness. That just made me so happy when I realized that, oh, right, she would love him because she loves damaged people. Right as we know from her first husband. And so she, oh, so wow. first Charlie husband, McCauley, what? Her first husband just broke my heart. It just broke I my heart. I know, Sebastian, I know, Sibby. It was so beautiful. Yeah, they're holding hands in bed. I know. So she's got, I mean, talk about open heart. She's got a huge heart. And then, so she'll have, you know, but thank you for asking that, Charlie, because I don't know if we'll see more of him, but maybe I'll try. <laughs> I'll try and figure that out because we don't have much more time left. Charlie's not young, but um, but thank you because he's always he just has touched me in a particular kind of way, and I'm very very glad to hear that that you feel that way. So thank you for asking that. Um, please, can we have more Olive? We love her so. <laughs> Marla. Oh, Olive, I. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. I don't it's know. Hard. It's, hard not, it's hard not to want more olive. Mm. Um, <laughs> and we have a question from Anne who says, I've always wondered where you got the idea for Lucy Barton and why you wrote her story. She is a moving character who stays with me. You know, it's very interesting. Um, Lucy, I really do not know where Lucy showed up from. I, I remember writing the first few pages and for some reason it got sent. And I honestly, I mean, this sounds, well, I didn't mean to do it, but it got sent as an attachment to my editor, which sounds crazy because like, obviously I know how to attach something, but I didn't mean to do it. So unconsciously I must have done it. Whatever, whatever, whatever. The point is that Susan Campbell said, you must write this. Huh. And that was so helpful for me because I really wasn't thinking. It was almost like a sketch that I was doing and that and and Susan said you must write this book. And that was really, really helpful to me. And so I did. And you know, I think um and I and I and I ended up really loving Lucy a lot. So but I, I don't know where she came from. Um but I will I will tell you that you know, I grew up in New Hampshire and in Maine, and in both places there were families like hers in town. I think every town has, yeah, and probably even more so now, a family like Lucy's, who, and they're just ostracized yes. by everybody because they're so poor and they're so strange. And and I really remember those different families and I and I really thought as I you know I thought let's give these people a voice you know let's step forward and say this is what it was like yeah so um I think that's all we have from our oh no here comes some more um so Abby says Olive's son Christopher ends up in a very different marriage than he first started and seems to grow emotionally quite a bit with his second wife. What made you decide to turn his life in this different and more emotionally developed direction? I love his second wife. Yeah. You know, um, because I saw Christopher, as I was talking earlier about people reaching a point in their life mm -hmm. where they can either grow or they diminish. And I saw Christopher as having the ability to grow. I mean, he doesn't do it smoothly because most, right. most of us don't. 
right. you know, but I, but I, I saw him, I always understood that he, you know, he'd had a difficult time with all of his, his mother and, you know, an only child and everything like that. But I always understood that he would eventually be able to have a real life and have many different people that he could love, which are, you know, these different children and, and his second wife. So that's, that's, that's my thinking about Christopher. Yeah. I mean, my, I think one of my favorite things that you've ever written is, is his wedding scene um, yeah. in her little bursts. And, and I always love that moment where she's ruminating on the two of them and says yeah. to herself, they think they're done with being lonely. And, yeah. Yeah. and it is, and it is, you know, sort of what we're talking about. You give a lot of these people who, um, who, choose to become bigger or stay smaller, they, they, they have another, ch they have a second chance at love, yeah. which is right. makes sense because yeah. um, what do you, what do we know when we're kids? <laughs> That's exactly all this point is she's looking at them, you know, and that was the very first solid story I ever wrote, by the way. Really? Yeah. yeah. I remember reading that in the New Yorker and thinking, Oh God, I hope there's more of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the first one I could, you know, I was unloading the dishwasher or something and all of a sudden I, I could feel the presence of this woman standing behind. I could sort of hear in her head saying, it's high time everyone goes home. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, I better get that down. <laughs> um, we have a question from Anne who wants to know if Bates influenced you. Bates, oh, excuse me. Bates College. Did Bates College. Oh, Bates College. Yeah, Bates was great for me. Um, Bates opened up a whole vista, um, partly because you know, I had, I had been somewhat isolated as a kid just because of my parents living so in the way that they did. But the point is that um, Bates was very good for me. And I had a professor there um, who was the chairman of the English department at that time. And he, he knew I wanted to be a writer. I mean, I didn't certainly run around telling everybody that I wanted to be, but he knew that. And um, when I wrote a paper for him, some analytical paper I wrote, and he gave me like a B or a B minus and I went to see him about that. And he said, you know what? I honestly don't think it would be good for you if I tried to teach you how to write an analytical paper. So every time there's a paper due, you give me a short story and it will be our little secret. So oh. I took every class I could from that man. I was amazing. And it was just wonderful because, and he was very honest. He'd say, well, this one doesn't work as well as the other one. And that's about all he'd say. But he was really, but it was like somebody was recognizing me as a writer. Yes. And it was enormously important to me. It's hugely important to have people like yeah. that. Who give yeah. You um, yeah. To your desires. Um, Lisa wants to know, what is the writing process like for you versus the revision process? Right. Um, they're very different although i have to tell you that as it, it seems and it's been this way for many years i think very often as soon as i write something i will automatically start to revise it like i'll look at it just as it's almost mm -hmm. just fallen out and i will start to think well that's not good you know and i'll and i will mess it up um on the page immediately and then so there's a revision that takes place almost as i'm writing it but then there's many different kinds of revisions you know there's like when okay well now we've got the whole manuscript now what do we really do with this and that's an entirely different kind of thing because that's like okay this just doesn't need to be here get rid of it or you know what's what does the reader need here why am i feeling like there's something the reader might need here you know so let's bring something back in but i've always liked revising um which is good because it's most of what i do with my life <laughs> um would you describe yourself as a feminist writer? I love how you write your characters, especially the women who maintain or find agency, hope, and renewal later in life. To me, that is certainly feminism. That's from Jim. It's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I went to see My Name is Lucy Barton with my daughter one afternoon. And, um, and I came out and I said, Zarina, that's a really feminist play. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> and I really, <laughs> and I said, yeah, and I just, I honestly didn't understand it until that day that I was sitting there with my daughter and then I realized, oh, that is a feminist play. And I'm very proud of that. Yes. So, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And I mean, take agency, right? Right. Take agency and be ruthless, right? So that's the advice that Lucy gets. Um, yeah. You have to be ruthless as an artist. And um, and I think one of the things, yeah, Lucy is such a feminist because she didn't have right. any role models as to how to do that, how to take agency. And but somehow exactly. in herself. And it is. Exactly. Yeah, and she pretty, absolutely does it. Yeah. Right. Your work is so. very humorous, sometimes darkly so, as with Olive. How do you manage to combine comedy with the dire circumstances some of your characters find themselves in? It's from Julie. Well, I'm I'm glad you I'm glad that you think I'm funny because because I actually think I'm funny as well. And back Thank in you. the day when my when my mother would read, she, my mother would get a galley and she'd call me up and you know seven hours later and she'd say, "This one's better than the last one." And then she but she always would say to me, "I howled my head off." Oh, that's and I would so say, oh, that's good. That's interesting. So there's some New England kind of humor thing going on that my mother recognized because she would say, I howled my head up. So um, I don't, I never consciously mean to be funny because I wouldn't know how to, but I, but I do think that pathos goes hand in hand with humor. And um, so it just, I think it just happens naturally, but I'm awfully glad that, you know, somebody would think I'm funny. So thank you. Yeah. I think you're very funny. Um, <laughs> And then I also have this question, and this can I think this can wind up our questions. Um, which authors, past or present, do you read and or love? Well, you know, I have, um, so oh, there's so, 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 so many. But when I was, you know, in my younger years, I went through the Russians. Mm -hmm. And even now I'm reading a biography of Turgenev, and I just can't seem to get enough of these Russians and their relationships with each other that are so interesting as I read these different biographies now. But so that was a real fertile place for me to go because they were, you know, they were just so um, right out there in their in their manners and and their writing, which was very different from the way I had been brought up. And it was so exciting to realize, oh, people just are saying these things and they're yelling and they're, you know, whatever. So that was a really big part of it. And then, um, but I think. I think as I got older that Alice Munro and William Trevor, I think of them as sort of my bookends because they're both, um, they've both been immensely important to me yeah. and they're, they're very different and yet lovely in their, in their different ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Both writers I love. Okay. We have one more. Um, I first read your book, Olive Kittredge when I was 15 in a class entitled secrets and lies. Would you say that the title reflects any themes in your books? In your book, sorry. Secrets and Lies. Yeah. Well, I think that, yeah, because I think that we're all about secrets and lies. <laughs> I don't think many of the people that I pass on the sidewalk um, don't have secrets and haven't told some lies. And, mm -hmm. and they're very, those are very seductive words for a writer because, you know, we want to go in there and find the secrets and the lies. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, without giving anything away, and uh, William, William, you know, faces um, the unfolding of a secret in a very modern way. Right, um, exactly, and, um, huge. Many and of us. Age. Yeah, are um, a lot of people are are, are dealing with, and um, forcing really um, so many people to redefine their ideas of family, and and it's exactly. all about secrets and lies. I know it's all about you. Just you know, it's so interesting because ever since I read that particular thing, which we're obviously not going to go into, but I but I've heard so many stories oh. about people in these situations, it's just, it's just all over the place. It's just I, fascinating. I, I have a couple it's of my fascinating. Know, we're being very oblique, which I'm sure is frustrating. I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> your books will all be in the mail tomorrow. And um, I can't, um, it's just a joy. And um, it was so wonderful to speak with you tonight. And oh, you're absolutely lovely. Thank you so much. Just you really books, wonderful. Laura. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you very, very much. And, and I want to everybody. I want to thank you both for supporting independent bookstores, 
Books and Books, on behalf of Books and Books, Harvard, Politics and Prose, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our viewers watching from everywhere. Um, your books mean so much to all of us, and we're just like thrilled that we could have this conversation. And for anyone who missed a little at the beginning, you will be able to re-watch it. We will send you a recording. So, um, so there's that. Anyway, thank, thank you so much to everybody. Thank you. And lovely to talk to you, Cynthia. Thank Just you. really lovely. Thank you. Good night, everyone.